Hello, hello everyone. Um, I'm Robin Burkett. I'm with the Accenture Technology Labs. Um, labs does research on security um, for things going three to five years out and the, the hope that we can uh, research things that will cause disruption in the industry. So I'm really excited to talk to you today about two things that I'm passionate about, security and user experience. My goal is to continue to raise awareness about the importance of user experience. Uh, so I'm going to cover what user experience is, show a few security tools, talk about some concepts that you can use to make sure that your tools have a positive user experience. This research is based on uh, some things I've done in the labs and also my own path into InfoSec. So the experiences I refer to are based on new people entering the field. First, why, why I'm inspired to do this. My first career was in information technology, long, long time ago. Um, I spent several years working um, through all phases of the systems development life cycle. Then I switched careers and started a photography business, which I ran for 10 years. Um, during that time, I also did website usability testing, just because it was a hobby and I was really interested in it. In it. Oops, sorry. <laughs> um, but I wanted to learn. So, oh, shoot, sorry. Shoot. Here, oh, I'm so sorry. Okay, let's go back. Um, oh, uh, this works this way. All right, so. Um, oh, I can't scroll. All right, first time speaker, everyone. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, all right, so I did website usability testing on the side uh, just because I really liked it. Um, loved doing my photography. And I knew I had to switch. I, I had to change paths when I had three consecutive Photoshop or photo shoots of dogs and clothes. So that's what that means. <laughs> uh, it is not one of mine. Actually, I, do, I keep all of my dogs and clothes pictures hidden. I don't put them on my blog, so I didn't have any I could pull from because I don't want people to know I do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's just the worst. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so when I found InfoSec, I knew that was gonna be my next career. So I went back to school and learned a, a, bunch, of school, a bunch of skills. A lot had changed. VI and SQL stayed the same, but VI changed to Vim somewhere. Um, but everything else was different. And I wanted to learn as fast as I could. But what I was finding was that I was learning a lot about tools, lots and lots of tools. And not just tools, but I had to learn tools in order to learn the tools. I'm talking about like virtual machines, VMware, and VirtualBox. Um, just so many interfaces and tutorial after tutorial. So I'd sit in class and do these tutorials. And I'd look around at my classmates. We'd be frustrated sometimes because they wouldn't work. Um, and if we were faced with a problem and the, the tool didn't work, we were stuck. We didn't know what to do. So it's frustrating in two ways. One, because we're spending time learning the tool and just, just being frustrated with interfaces that didn't follow standards. But two, because I wasn't learning about security. And ultimately, that's what I wanted to do, was learn about security quickly. So let's talk about user experience. It's really the experience someone has when they're using a tool or a product. But what it really boils down to is feelings. Nothing more than feelings. Sorry, I had to. <laughs> How does a tool make you feel? Is it confused, frustrated, disgruntled? But then you may say, there aren't feelings in InfoSec. Well, and yet there are. Why do you think there's so much alcohol involved? So UX and security involves users, um, security professionals, and attackers. It really involves everyone. Well, I talked a little bit about interfaces and the user experience, but one distinction to talk about is it's not a GUI versus command line argument, because a lot of people want to make it that. Um, if you find yourself thinking GUI versus command line, one's better than the other, stop, because it's not that. It's about the right tool for the job. So if you're doing a quick script, you probably want to write it in Bash. If you're doing an involved program, you know, you probably want a text editor. It's not about design either, even though design really helps. Um, it's about the experience, and the experience comes down to how you feel in, you, in, in, making, uh, in accomplishing your task. 
So best tool for the job equals best experience equals satisfaction. Um, and feelings are really important. Um, whether we acknowledge them or not, they often determine how successful a tool will be. So how can you tell if a tool is usable? One word, we'll need. Um, so these are some of the criteria. Is it, use, is it needed and helpful? Well, most security tools are built out of need. So this is almost always true. So that's cool. Um, can I learn how to use it on my own? Because security people want to be empowered to do things on their own. And once I've learned how to use it, can I remember how to use it? Does it get the job done right? And is it, does it get the job done and is it right? And within a reasonable amount of time and effort? Is it desirable? Do people like it? Um, so that's a little subjective, but still very important. And at the bottom is delightful. This, if you can make your tool delightful, like fun to use, that's a home run. But don't really aspire to that um, from the security perspective yet, because we've got to get all these, all these first. If you, the fewer of these that you have, the, the worst user ex or the, the poorer the user experience that someone has. There are a lot of hidden costs to a security tool with bad user experience. People avoid using it. Um, if you ever had a tool, you're like, I hate that. You don't want to use it. Um, well, inevitably, you may have to use it. Maybe a, a tool got purchased at your, at your work and you're just going to have to use it. Or maybe it's the only game in town. So you just then have to spend time learning how to use it. Because um, time is money. And uh, as you're spending time to, to use it, um, you're basically Googling how to use it and then filtering through all of the different criteria for you know, what's relevant to you. Um, and some tools require training. So if you're going to training and you don't use the tool right away, then it gets wasted. That money is just kind of wasted on the training. But I think the biggest hidden cost of a bad user experience is the opportunity cost. And that is, when you're spending time using a tool, you're not spending time learning about security. Um, you're spending time just working on an interface when your ultimate goal is get better at security. So I'm going to go through some tools. My intent is not to call out any specific tools as good or bad, just to talk a little bit about the experience. So anyone recognize this? Yeah. Yeah, this is a tool I had in one of my classes. It teaches you how to simulate networks. And it's a great tool because, you know, any tools that help you te that teach you security are, you know, great to have out there. But it's an example of a tool where there's no clear direction. Um, you pretty much have to watch a tutorial in order to use the tool. Um, there's nothing when you, you open this up, there aren't any real helpful hints. In case you happen to notice there is one, right here at the very bottom, and it says, select a device to drag and drop to the workspace. So that's a line of routers that you can then drag your routers up, um, but then you're stuck again. So you pick one, and now what? So if, you're, if a user is stuck at an interface thinking, now what do I do, or what do I do next, that's not a good user experience. In contrast, the autopsy tool. Uh, this is a tool I, uh, I use in forensics classes, and it guides the user through everything that they need to do just to get to the point where they can use their security knowledge. It gives you options that are very, it's very clear what to do. You can't mess this up. And when you have a tool that you can't mess up, that feels good. It's like, I can't mess this up. It's, it, you know, it, it's, it takes some pressure off. Um, and I'd say it's slightly delightful um, because who wouldn't want a dog as part of their tools? Um, and also, it doesn't have clothes. <laughs> So autopsy, <laughs> uh, it gives you uh, the steps that it's going through. It highlights what step that you're on. Uh, it guides the process. So if you're a beginner, um, you can just use the tool as it is. If you're advanced, you can make adjustments as you need to. And it just works. So this is the screen that you come to when you're going to analyze the data. Now you bring the knowledge, your forensics knowledge. A beginner can use it with whatever level of knowledge they have. An advanced expert can use it. There's a file structure on the side that, that is a, a common convention that's understandable. Um, and it also allows for plugins. So there are custom plugins out there that are already written for people that want to make this tool do more. But if you want to really be advanced, you can write your own plugins. So it's a tool for both beginners and advanced. And I heard a, a classmate of mine say, I love this tool. And when he said, I love this tool, it made me take note, because that's what you want. That's a good user experience. And that's really what you strive for. Now, InMap. This is one of the very first tools that you use as a security person. Um, it's kind of daunting for beginners. I remember the first time I did an InMap scan, 
I basically just typed in the command that someone told me to. They said, type this in, hit enter. I'm like, okay, let me get all the letters right. Um, but I wasn't learning anything. So, but Nmap is great, and one could say, um, you know, there are the man pages. So, you know, what's the problem? Just go to the man pages. Well, yeah, and I love the man pages because there's so much data there. Um, but for Nmap, 103 pages of single space information. So if you want to do an Nmap scan and you want to find out relatively quickly uh, what, you're, what you're looking for, it's not the most efficient way to go. So what, what Nmap did around 2008, they created this awesome tool called ZimMap. And when I saw it, I was like, wow, finally a tool that makes sense and I don't have to figure out how to use. So what they did, the purpose of it was not to replace Nmap, but to make Nmap more useful. Um, there are only a few fields to enter. You just enter in the IP address or range that you want to scan. Um, you can pick from a dropdown of the different types of scans. So if you're not sure, you can feel relatively confident that one of these scans is going to give you some really good information. Uh, it also builds the command while you're on the tool. So I'm learning. If, if I don't know what Nmap is, I can see what command is being built based on what I'm doing. And then I can start learning. So from this, I can see um, I picked all TCP ports. I can see dash P and all the ports. And then I can go, huh, if I want to scan for SSH, maybe I just do dash P22. Like I can start thinking and figuring things out on my own. Because I'm comfortable on this tool, I start exploring. And when I start exploring, then I start learning. And when I learn on my own, I enjoy the experience. So that's really what you want. You want users to explore and think about what they're doing um, with the different tools like this. Uh, you can also run a diff. You can run different scans and then see the difference between the two. So then you can learn what the different scans are doing. So it's a really great tool to teach what things are doing. But it's also good for advanced users. Then with the results, you get back easily readable, organized in a table keeps track of all your scan results, so you don't have to remember. Uh, and you know, it also, it's, it's an old tool, so I'm not really talking about the de design of the tool, but it does include a graphical network mapping, which is much nicer to look at and understand than the Nmap results. So one last tool, Netstat. Now everyone is aware, or I mean, I don't know if everyone's aware of Netstat, but it is also a pretty common tool to see what connections you have. Um, it's deprecated. Does everybody know it's deprecated? I know. It's not, except it is. If you look online, apparently, or they say it's deprecated, but everyone still use it, uses it. So I kept it in because it's out there and people use it all the time. Um, so the, the user experience with Netstat, I do like it because it's really quick. But there's, there are some challenges, like little micro interactions that are negative, like, oh, you're not admin, so make sure you're admin. And then it scrolls to the bottom. And then I'm, oh, I got to scroll back up to the top. Um, but it gives a lot of good information. But the, then the results, they don't fit all in the same window. Still, the information's there. So Windows, and Windows, at least starting in Windows 7, comes up with a resource, the Windows Resource mon Monitor. And that takes the same data, makes it a little bit more readable. Um, so all the data is there, but it's, um, it's still not that easy to parse out information. So then I found this tool called Glasswire. And this is the first network tool that I've seen that took a real design approach to networking. Um, and when I opened it up and started looking at it, I really had a great experience. Um, it shows you uh, the incoming traffic, the outgoing traffic, what applications are there. Um, the host that you're connected to. There's a wealth of information here. Oh, I can have a pointer. Um, and down here is a timeline. So if you see any peaks of traffic, you can just drag the slider over to the timeline and see what was happening at that point. It's a very interactive tool. And because it was so easy to use, I, once I started, I kept it up. So I have this up on a second monitor of mine, and it's helping me understand a baseline of what is normal. Um, and when I went out to look at uh, some of the forums out there just to see what other people were saying, security people, sysad admins, they were saying, hey, we love this tool. Make it for Linux, make it for Mac, because we want to use this tool. So it's a definite, it's, it's something that people really like. And they are making a Mac version by the, I think by the end of the year, and then hopefully to maybe going on f uh, further. But this tool is one of those tools, easy to use, requires exploration, helps people easily understand what's going on in their environment. So I really like this, and it was a great user experience. 
So I've heard, you know, what if we make tools too usable? Because, you know, you don't want tool jockeys that don't know what they're doing that are just pushing buttons. Well, the goal of improving tools, it's not to lower the barrier of entry. It's to make it easier, make it, make it easier for people to get to a high level of functioning that they need to be effective. I reached out to a professor to ask her experience in teaching a lot of these tools. And she said there's a concern of creating goo idiots, um, folks that don't understand what they're doing. Um, they just are using the tool. Well, we don't want that. Security professionals have a responsibility to know what their goal is, know what's going to get them there, and be able to tell if they're getting correct results. So you, you still have to bring the knowledge, um, but making tools easier to use helps. It makes it easier for folks to learn. Now, this is what's going on in the world. We all know this. There's a shortage of talent. We have lots of jobs that are open. Um, they're, uh, that we, we're going to have a lot of new influx into security. And we just don't have enough people. So this trend isn't going away. And on the other side of the fence, criminals understand the importance of a good user experience. They're hiring professional designers to design their exploit kits. So take, for example, um, this is the black hole expo exploit kit. Um, uh, it's very easy. You can see where you would put in information up here. It's really nicely well designed. This is the control panel. I can't read it, but I can tell you that that's prob those two things are probably, it's probably beginning date and ending date, because there's a date thing here. I can see it's easy to know where I'm going to uh, input information. This is probably really important, whatever it is. They're using like a hierarchical design. <laughs> Uh, but you can kind of deduce without even speaking the language, I know what I should be looking for. And then this is probably just a, you know, detail, details around this information. So they're designing their inter interfaces really well. We need to continue to do that and make that a, a priority. Um, so there's an expectation that people need to know everything about security and it's just not realistic. There are experts in multiple fields and they often have to use tools in other fields. And they're not beginners by any means, but they're just beginners using those tools. So if we can make those tools less complicated, less confusing, um, that just helps us shift around in the industry a little bit better. So the takeaway. We can do better. Uh, usability has to be as important as functionality. Part of the InfoSec, InfoSec culture, it's like the more complicated steps to go through to solve a problem, the more rewarding it is. Well, we're all up for a challenge, but we don't have time for that. The easy thing should be easy. Having hard to use tools means that it takes more time for new people to learn them, which means it takes more time for them to be effective. Um, we still have so many low-hanging fruits of that uh, low-hanging fruits that attackers are um, exploiting that our security foundation is not strong. So if we can make our tools better to empower the new people coming in to understand security better, that will build up a stronger foundation and we won't have so many low-hanging fruits. So if, uh, if you are creating a tool, anyone here create tools? Awesome. Thank you so much for, for being here. Um, just you, you may be doing this already, but think about all user levels when you create that tool. If you can create it to be used by beginners and advanced, beginners can start in there and then grow into the advanced level, and it just makes it a nice, a nice way to continue to learn. Add user experience to your development process. Follow standard conventions um, and establish design patterns. Watch users use your tool. That's one of the most critical things, because you'll be surprised. You know how to use your tool because you've created it, so you know what to expect. So users may surprise you, so it's great to, to, to watch them. Um, and give users a way to give feedback, not just about the functionality of your tool, but the use about your usability. You don't want people to be thinking about your tool. You do want them to be thinking about security and baselines and um, networking and how systems work, um, anomalies, things that teach them to be a better security professional. And that frees them up um, to think about creative ways to solve problems, not just tools. And once they know that, then they can train other people in that way as well. So that, what, what, I'm, what I just wanted to do is just raise awareness about user experience and say this can be the tipping point that makes it, that, that turns things around and helps the security ind industry. Oh. A few more things. That's the end of the talk, but I wanted to go through a couple resources. Uh, this, this is the book, Lori Faith Craner. She spoke yesterday. I don't know if you saw her, uh, but this is a great book on security and usability. Also, uh, this is Steve Krug, Don't Make Me Think. 
Ideally, you can hire a UX team. If you can't, this is a great book um, that will give you some tips on how to make your tools more, more, uh, more useful. This, I love this one, Inmates Are Running the Asylum. This is basically, this is what happens when engineers design tools. <laughs> Uh, then there's also anti-patterns. If you really want to dig deep, I, I, wow, if people read this book when it came out, I don't think we'd be where we are today. Uh, so this is a really great book. Uh, now there's a couple organizations out there, just, they're just out there to promote better, usable, more usable tools. Simply Secure, they want to help people build better security tools, so you should check them out. Um, UI Patterns is a great uh, website that you can go to. It has a lot of examples of things that have already been created, like don't reinvent the wheel, search screens, login screens, things that already exist out there. There are patterns that people know and understand, and you want to use those. People don't want to relearn things like that. Uh, then another, uh, this interaction design, um, they're a nonprofit, and they are here, they just want to raise the level of design globally. So they have a lot of training that, that are out there that you can go take. I um, love talking about this. Um, I'm really glad you guys came. And if you have any questions or thoughts uh, or want to contact me, yes. So the first thing that comes back is that you can look at a network, for example, and I can actually tell you the competence of the person who's just scanned me based on the patterns that are inherent in that signature. And those are almost directly relatable back to their skill with the tool. So if the interface can help bring their skill up faster, that's great. But at the same token, if it encourages them to not bother to get better at the tool, that's conversely not great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I mean, the whole purpose, I mean, we want everybody to get better. So yeah, I agree. I was just wondering, you highlighted ZenMap, and I'm wondering if the greatest value of that tool is in making that interface discoverable or in constraining the choices that you have to make in order to start up a successful scan? Um, well, it, the, dro the drop down does constrain the choices, if that's what you mean, but you can hand type in a command. Like if you're an advanced user and you know you want to do something more advanced than the drop down, you, and you know what you want, you can hand type it in, so it doesn't stop you from doing that. Oh. I, I know, but just from getting started perspective and making that tool discoverable, not having to dig through a hundred something page man page. Yeah, when you say make it discoverable? In the sense of knowing, not having to know what all of the flags do per se. Oh, yeah. Having that, like having a map into what that UI actually, the command line UI actually is. Yeah, so the question is, is, is the user... Is it that that makes it better? Oh, it's both. It's hugely both because it makes it easy for me to use, so or easy for anyone to use, and it's so it's it's partly that, but then it's also uh, sorry the learnability, the um, having the options of the drop down that you can pick from. Um, so okay, say what was your question again? <laughs> I was. I was it's, it's I was both just wondering if we were trying it, to pick it, something that to emulate and to learn from ZenMap. Uh, yes. Which of, would you say both of them are the, like, the synergy between the two is the important part? I would say both are, that's right, okay, but about the learnability. Both, because what makes me a better security professional is learning stuff, and I want to learn stuff. So when the tool empowers me to learn stuff, I love that tool, and I want to use it more because I want to learn more. And when it makes sure that I can't mess up, Love that too. It makes it very quick and easy. Um, and yeah, it's, I'd say it's, it's both of those. We kind of need both. We need easy tools, but we don't want tool jockeys. We don't want easy tools that people just press a button and get the results. Like you want people to be thinking behind these tools. So as an engineer who creates tools frequently, we're often constrained by time that it takes to implement said tool, usually in either creating an API or making it extensible. Uh, bug testing, um, regression testing, all of those things that, that we tend to do, um, and often user experience is the last thing that we can tend to think about because we're under time constraint. Yeah. So as an engineer, what can we do to improve that workflow? Should we be focusing on the back end and make, because 
as engineers, we tend to think of users as monkeys that are going to push every button that they can. Yeah. So should we be focusing on making it robust and extensible and reusable and putting it out in a space where other people can build the UX on top or the UI on top of our base software? Or should we be focusing on the user experience from you know, the ground up? Yeah, I guess it depends on what your, what your goal is. If your goal is to have users use it, then you should have user experience start from the very beginning and really understand how they would want to use your tool. If you do that first and they love your tool and it's usable, they're not, they're not going to go looking for other tools. Now, if, you're more import, if, if the back end engine is what's most important to you, then sure, you could let other people go out and build an interface in front of it. But if you want to be the best game in town, then you start at the beginning and just in incorporate users from the beginning. You get their, their input and know what they need to do and y you'll be set. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so uh, thank you, Robin. Uh, so we, if we have more questions, we can take it offline. Robin is here. You can take her. Uh, you can ask more questions to her. Uh, so we are up for the next speaker. Give a good round of applause to Robin.